the market is very volatile. It will reward you handsomely over the course of decades. But in the short term, I tell people, if you don't stay the course, if you panic and sell when the market drops, and the market will drop, I'm not predicting it's going to do that tomorrow. I have no idea when it's going to happen next, but it will happen because that's the nature of the market. Welcome to the Journey to Launch podcast with your host, Jamila Souffrant. As a money expert who walks her talk, she helps brave journeyers like you get out of debt, save, invest, and build real wealth. Join her on the journey to launch to financial freedom in, in five, four, three, two, one. Hey, 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 journeyers. Welcome to the Journey to Launch podcast. It's the month of August. And if you have not been aware yet, maybe you're just first finding out about the podcast. Maybe you've been listening for a while. In the month of August, we're just doing some rewind episodes of some of my favorite past episodes that I think you need to either hear again if you heard it already, or you can hear for the first time again because this content is super still relevant and relatable to wherever you are on your journey. This episode is from episode 141. So this was originally episode 141 with J.L. Collins. Now he wrote the book, The Simple Path to Wealth. And it has literally been where I send people when they ask me about how to get started with investing. I actually usually send them to his free blog first. Um, He has this great stock series on his blog that I will link again in the show notes. And it just allows you to understand the concept of investing and then dives into index investing. So I do want to make clear, like we are not financial advisors. This is not investment advice. But I will say this, that for me, learning about index investing and how simple it was, was something that changed the trajectory of my wealth because it's something that I heavily invest in in terms of it's simple, it's low cost, and we have access to it. It's like you can access it and you'll hear more about this in this episode. But I thought, you know what? This is one of those staples that everyone needs to hear, not once, but twice. So buckle up, get your pen and paper out, take some notes and listen to this episode with JL Collins, where we talk about the simple path to wealth. It doesn't need to be complicated. The simple path to wealth and all you need to know about index investing. If you want the episode show notes for this episode, go to journeytolaunch.com or click the description of wherever you're listening to this episode. In the show notes, you'll get the transcribed version of the conversation, the links that we mentioned, and so much more. Also, whether you are an OG journeyer or brand new to the podcast, I've created a free jumpstart guide to help you on your financial freedom journey. It includes the top episodes to listen to, stages to go through to reach financial freedom, resources, and so much more, you can go to journeytolaunch.com slash jumpstart to get your guide right now. Okay, let's hop into the episode. Hey, journeyers, I am so excited to talk to the legend, (laughs) J.L. Collins. J.L. wrote an amazing book called The Simple Path to Wealth. I always direct people to that book and to his amazing stock series and website, which just breaks down investing and reaching financial independence in a way that I just think most people need to like see because a lot of it can seem overwhelming. So JL, I'm so excited to be able to talk to you and then basically have you distill so what I know will be great information to my audience. So welcome to the podcast. Well, Jamila, thank you for the wonderful introduction. And I am excited to be here and look forward to talking to you and by extension, your audience. Yeah. So, I mean, I, there's a lot of things that like just... I feel like I could like start with with your story, but in <laughs> in general, you said which I thought was pretty neat that you actually reached financial independence and didn't know it. And I want you to kind of like take us there because it's like that everyone who listens to this podcast that's what they want. They want to live a life where it's on their own terms. They can take breaks when they want, and you were doing that without even knowing that you were doing it. So can you just talk about like coming to realize that you were financially independent, and then we're gonna talk about how you got there. Yeah. So when I was walking this path in, in my early years, I had no frame of reference. I had, had never heard the term financial independence. I'm not sure it had even been coined yet, uh, let alone the, the term FIRE or financial independence retire early. I had come across the idea of FU money 
uh, in the early 70s, and that was out of a novel by James Covell, uh, Noble House by name. And uh, there was a character in that novel that had a goal of, of accumulating FU money. And that crystallized what I was after, but it wasn't a concept of having enough money to never work again and retire. It was more a concept of having enough that you could leave any job you wanted to whenever you wanted, but with the idea that you'd probably go back to work. At least that's what was in my head. And that's, in fact, what I did through my career is periodically, I loved my jobs and I loved my career, but I didn't want to do it all the time. So periodically, I took little sabbaticals on my own. And in uh, about 1989, I I began the longest, what turned out to be the longest of those, which was five years. And shortly after that, for a variety of reasons, my wife, Jane, uh, left her job. And then in 1992, our daughter was born. So a lot happened in that five-year period. We didn't have any income coming in. And at the end of each year, I would total up uh, our investments and uh, our expenses for the year. And and uh, we had not changed our lifestyle. Now, to be clear, we were living a fairly modest lifestyle, but nonetheless, we didn't cut back when we gave up our jobs. So we maintaining the same living that we had had before. And I noticed about three years in something remarkable, and that was that even though we were living that same lifestyle, spending the same amount of money every year, our net worth was higher than the year before. And I knew something amazing had happened, but I didn't have a frame of reference to name it. Uh, I didn't know about FI or financial independence. I'm not sure that to- that term had been coined at that point, let alone FIRE, which is uh, financial independence, retire early. Uh, and kind of embarrassingly, I, I well, I noted this and thought, wow, that's pretty cool. The ramifications of it never sunk in. It never occurred to me that this might mean that I never had to work again. I think part of that was that I liked working and I was kind of looking forward to the next job at that point. But yeah, so I didn't realize what it was called when I got there, but I I knew something remarkable had happened. But how did you get there, right? So for so many people, you have very extensive like history and the different types of careers and industries that you worked in. But while you were working, how did you know to be so astute with your money at that point? Because a lot of people will could be in the same regard, working, working, they get to the point later on in their life where they don't have the assets to be able to you know, quit or take sabbaticals like that. So how did you get to that point without even knowing it? Was it just that you saved and invested here and there? Was there what, something along the way that happened? Well, so first of all, I... Someone once asked me how I know so much about this investing stuff, and my answer is, if there's a mistake to be made in investing, I have probably made it. So I have. it's been a long, painful, very expensive education as I, I blundered from mistake to mistake, but I did learn along the way. And I think what got me there was, was a couple of things. One, I, I did have this goal of, of having FU money, and of course, that meant saving and investing, and FU money eventually grows into being financially independence level money uh, as a matter of course. And I think that's what happened. And that was the surprise thing I noticed around, I don't know, 1991 or so. But yeah, I had started investing because I knew I wanted to have that that FU money. And I'd always liked the idea of having the security and the freedom that having investments and having money working for me represented. Right. So can we talk a little bit about a few money because it's such a powerful concept and tool for everyone. And you have a wonderful video about it. So I'll link it in the show notes for this episode. But can we talk about what a few money is and what it allows for you to do? Well, you, well if you link to that, uh, I assume you're you're talking about my my takeoff on on John Goodman's piece in The Gambler. If you link to that, be sure to warn people about the language. Ah, yes, yes. A lot of lang- <laughs> language, yes. Yeah. So FU money actually it means different things to different people. Uh, and for a lot of people, it's synonymous with being financially independent. That is having enough money that work is completely op- optional. For me, it was only having enough money that I could comfortably step away from a job if I chose to. So the first time I, th- I considered myself as having a few money and the first time I stepped away from a job, I had a total of $5,000. 
but I knew that $5,000 was enough to allow me to travel uh, to Europe, which is what I wanted to do at the time, and would provide enough cushion to get me into the next job. Um, a lot of people would say, wow, that's way, way too little, and that would be hard to argue with, but I was young and maybe reckless, and it was enough for me, and it worked out. Uh, so I've always seen FU money as a stepping stone to full financial independence. FU money is the money that allows you to initially buy your freedom, to give you breathing room, to step away from situations that might not be working for you anymore, but it's still allowing you to have that cushion to, to uh, make the transition into whatever comes next. Yeah. And I think um, it's almost like, you know, people have the concept of emergency savings and that's in case anything happens. But if you like take it, put it like emergency st- savings on steroids, it's like, depending on how you look at it, it's, it's, a, it's a more, depending on your goals, a like heftier, bigger pot possibly for the breaks that you need, which, so that's one of the things that I did when I quit my job to basically jump into entrepreneurship full time. We had to create a runway for ourselves, some breathing room to allow for that. And so I consider us building up our FU fund along our way, like as I was working still to be able to take this leap. So I know a lot of people, like when they think of financial independence, it's a big topic. Like for a lot of people, it can take a long time depending on their starting point and how much debt they have. But I think the concept of at least getting to a place where you have a few money to get some breathing room to take a break and to have some more options, like, right, to find another job or to take a sabbatical is really, I think most people can get to in their lifetime. So I think that concept will resonate with a lot of people. Yeah, I think absolutely. Most people, if if they understand it's a possibility that it's, I mean, a lot of people are not even aware of the concept of doing such a thing. But I think once people become aware of it, virtually anybody can do it. And it really doesn't matter what you call it. And it's it's not a, a you know, it's not a final destination. I mean, the moment you start, the moment you start saving and investing money, you have begun the journey of, of building FU money that, if you take my definition, ultimately comes full financial independence. But each additional dollar makes you that much stronger, makes the chains that less tighter. And so even though it seems, progress seems slow in the beginning, particularly against that, that goal out there in the distant future, it's important for people listening to realize that each dollar, each step brings you closer, makes you stronger, makes you freer. Yeah, I love that. Lucens like every every dollar paid or going towards the right direction buys back a little bit more of your freedom. <laughs> yeah. So, I know one of the reasons why you wrote the stock series, which is great, by the way, um, was to help your daughter out. So as you were in terms of now like taking sabbaticals and living this kind of semi FI life, because you did enjoy working, right? So you continue to work. Um, how did you now then say, you know what, I need to start sharing this with more people? What made it more intentional for you, where you said to yourself, this needs to be shared with the world more? Well, I <laughs> this is true confession time, Jamil. I I'm actually not that that generous a person. That thought never crossed my mind really. I I had tried to persuade my daughter Jessica to listen to this stuff and and I I probably pushed it too hard too early and I and I turned her off. So at one point, I started writing these things down, the, the investment advice and knowledge I wanted her to have and against the day that she might be willing to hear it. And just in case when that day came, I wasn't around to, to have the verbal conversation. And I shared some of these uh, letters that I'd written to her with uh, a colleague of mine. And he, he said, you know, Jim, this is, this is pretty interesting stuff. And you might think about putting it on a blog and sharing it with your family and friends. And the idea of sharing it with my family and friends was mildly interesting to me. But what appealed to me was what a great way to archive the information for Jessica if and when the time came. And I had heard of blogs, but I joke that the first blog post I ever read was the first blog post I ever wrote. So I created this blog mainly as a way to archive the information for Jessica. And then I did send it around to family and friends. And of course, they didn't care. <laughs> you know, nobody listened. The people who know you best are not the ones who listen to you. But then kind of to my amazement, it, the blog began to, to 
to attract a, a broader audience of people who are not family and friends, people I didn't know. And uh, over the years, it's it's grown to rather remarkable size. And I now have this international audience. And in a very gratifying way, I have people pretty routinely tell me I have profoundly changed their lives for the better. But if I'm honest, that was not, and I'm, I'm thrilled by that, and I'm happy by it, and I take satisfaction in it. But I would be lying to you if I said, yes, that was my grand plan to make the world a better place. I was just <laughs> trying to get my kid to listen to me. Yeah, and look at the result of that. So, I mean, let's get a little bit into like investing. That's what I think you do such a great job at breaking down index investing. So when did you discover, so when you started, when you were working and saving up for FU money, at that point, were you needing to get out of debt yourself or were you always good with money for the most part? And so it was really about investing what you had after expenses. And then were you directly investing in index funds at the time? Or how did you start investing and learning about it? (laughs) So Jamila, you're bringing out all my dirty little secrets. (laughs) (laughs) So first, first of all, uh, I have never uh, been in debt. Uh, I've never even had a car payment other than I've, I've carried mortgages on a couple of houses that I've owned over, over the years, but that's the only debt I've ever had. In fact, when I was working on the book, uh, The Simple Path to Wealth, uh, Tim, my editor, said, you know, we, we need a chapter in here about debt. And I said, yeah, I don't know anything about debt. I've never been in debt. I've never had a wrestle with that particular demon. And so I'm not sure I'm the right guy to, to write this. But he was very insistent. And finally, I said, well, I'll tell you what, you outline it because he had, he, he had wrestled with debt himself. I said, you outline what you think it ought to look like, and I will write it. And, uh, and that's what we did. And there's now a chapter on debt in the book. And, and uh, it's, it's, been one of the more widely praised chapters of all. So I'm gratified that he, he pushed me to do that. So debt was never really a problem. In the, but the dirty little secret you're uncovering is that when I achieved FI, I, and again, around 1989, I was not an index investor. I did it by picking individual stocks and, and actively managed funds, which is something that, that I am strongly against doing now. Now, it's important to understand that it's it's not that you can't succeed doing those things because clearly I did. The problem is that it's a whole lot more work and it's not nearly as powerful as indexing. Um, one of the great ironies is Jack Bogle uh, created the first, because Jack Bogle's the founder of Vanguard and and he created the first index fund in 1975, which just coincidentally happens to be the first year I started investing. Uh, I didn't know that that was happening at the time, and I would not have been wise enough to embrace it at the time. In fact, when I finally learned about indexing in about the mid-80s, let's call it 1985, I resisted the idea. And it took me an embarrassingly long time to to really fully embrace how powerful it was and to, and to switch over. And I want to say, Jamila, that was probably early 2000s, you know, 2000, 2001, 2002, somewhere in there. But yeah, I achieved financial independence before I embraced indexing. Mm. Uh, but I would have gotten there faster and the portfolio would be bigger if I had uh, been smarter and embraced it sooner. Yeah. And, I think we probably should step back just a little bit because while we know what an index fund is, there might be just some people really new to this and um, just like, okay, let's just quickly describe what an index fund is. So would you do us that honor to quickly tell us what an index fund is as it relates to individual stock? Sure. So before Bogle came up with the first index fund in 1975, if you were going to invest in the stock market, you either bought individual stocks or you bought into a mutual fund that was actively managed by someone who selected individual stocks. And what Bogle's great insight was, is that those ways of investing are inherently expensive because of the transaction costs and because of paying the managers to do it. And the research indicates that that they're not particularly successful in just outperforming 
a random selection of stocks, especially if that random selection of stocks was everything in the index. Now, what do I mean by index? Well, an index is nowadays, it could be anything. It could be all the stocks that are in real estate investment trusts, for instance, or all the gold mining stocks or all the technology stocks. But what I recommend and what Mogul first created was a broad-based index fund of U.S. stocks. His first one was the S&P 500 index fund, which simply meant that it bought every stock in every one of the top 500 companies in the United States. The fund that I prefer that came later is the total stock market index fund, which buys every single publicly traded company in the United States, which is around, it varies, but it's around 3,600 companies. So you are broadly diversified. And the research over the years is more and more confirmed that that broad-based index, whether it's the S&P 500 or the total stock market, soundly outperforms the vast majority of, of active managers who are trying to pick and choose uh, individual stocks that will do better than other individual stocks. And there you go. And at, at a much lower cost, which means that it's much, much harder for those individual matter, managers to compete, even if they're pretty good stock pickers, because their cost structure is just higher. Great explanation. Yeah. And I think it's wonderful because before I came across this concept and knew what this was, I had no clue about index investing or what it was. And um, that's primarily how I invest now. And I think so for so many people, when they think about, okay, they want to invest, they want to do all these things. The first thing that they think of, or maybe they don't know about is index funds. So they think about individual stocks like that actually seems like the more it's more complicated, but it seems to be like the first thing that comes to mind when people think of investing. And there's this whole other avenue for people where it's not as complicated (laughs) to me and not as time doesn't take as much time It's not as as expensive doing it via index investing. And I think it's a way in which when people know about it and then use it as a tool for them to reach their financial goals and investing goals, it's amazing. But I have so many people who say to me, like, I have no clue. I didn't even know this was a thing or that you can do it. So I think it's great that we are bringing more light to index investing. Well, and I I think it's not surprising that people hear about investing in individual stocks or actively managed stock funds, because those are the things Wall Street promotes those are the things that make Wall Street rich. So Wall Street is never going to turn around and promote index funds because there's no money in it for them. There's money in it for the investor. <laughs> and that's, that's, that's what matters. So at least matters to us and, and to your audience. But, you know, the, you're never going to see ads in Money Magazine for index funds, or, or I wouldn't think you would because those fund companies are much better served if you buy their actively managed funds that they're going to charge you a lot more money for. Yeah, the brokers are more better served if you're buying and selling stocks that they're making commissions on than if you're buying an index fund and holding it for a long term. But if you want the best results for the least cost, indexing is, is pretty clearly the way to go. Right. And you can invest in index funds um, via your retirement account. So if you're you're with a company that has access to index funds and has that as an option, you can actually do that through your retirement accounts. And then of course, be a taxable account. So things that are not related to retirement accounts, you can also invest in index funds. So I want to make that clear because then some people will ask, okay, so how do I get started? Where do I go? And the first step for me is to make sure that if you have an employer-sponsored retirement plan, especially if they give you a company match, go and look to see if they have options to invest in index funds. And then even in your series, you say if they don't have the option of index funds, there's a way you can creatively simulate one, you know, um, and you have that in your series. Yeah. You know, it's when you, when you talk about company sponsored uh, plans like 401ks and 403bs and that sort of thing, I think it's gotten a lot better. Initially, they tended not to have index funds. And I think more and more they are offering them because people are demanding it. But I tell people that if you look at the typical 401k, uh, 403b plan, uh, you know, they offer an incredible number of different funds to choose from, which I think is a disservice, first of all. It just makes things confusing. 
But if you want to find easily find the index funds in that 20, 30, 50 list of various funds, a simple way to do is go find the column that shows the ER or expense ratio. That's how much they're going to charge you on an annual basis for it. And the lower that number, the better, because the lower that number, the less you're being charged to own that fund. If you run your finger down that column and identify the absolute lowest numbers in that column, which should be something like 0.04 to 0.07, those will be the index funds. And then you can just look at, and there will be maybe two or three, four, and then you can zero in and look at those and see exactly what the index is. Is it the S&P 500? Is it the total stock market? Uh, and that'll help you identify, easily identify the index funds in your plan. Yeah, yeah. And re- like literally, so this is really taking a more active approach. You going in and logging in to see what's available in your current retirement accounts. And then if you're at the, p- the part where you're now, or you're investing in, you know, like a Roth, IRA, if you have that option, you have more leverage because you could do that outside your company. So you should pick where you, you know, you take that money to, or if you're doing after-tax investments, you can begin to like see your options because there are options out there. You just have to do the research a little bit, but I think yeah. a good start is index funds. Like, <laughs> Yeah. And if you're, yeah, your point well taken and Jamila, if, and just to emphasize it, if you're, if you're investing in an IRA, whether it's a traditional or a Roth, you get to choose what investment company you go with. Uh, My preference is Vanguard for a variety of reasons. And you get to choose what fund. uh, So you're not limited in your choices. So that's, you can easily uh, fund those with index funds. And of course, if you're opening a taxable account, the same thing applies. You know, you, you get to make all the choices, the fund company you go with and the specific funds you go into. And so for a lot of people, right, the concept of investing. So to me, like saving, I was never taught much about money growing up. I mean, the thing that my mother and grandmother did instill in me is to save. So we were always kind of good savers where we put money away and at least we have it for something that we wanted to do. But that doesn't bring you wealth, right? Because especially if you're putting it in a traditional savings account, it's getting your your gains are getting eroded by inflation. And so for a lot of people, they're kind of stuck with, even if they're doing okay, it's like a lot of their money is possibly in the savings account or maybe some is in a high yield account if they have been so bold enough to say, okay, I'm going to like take a risk. But the <laughs> part of things for a lot of people is scary. There's all this talk that, you know, there's going to be a crash. There's people have lost money in the stock market, obviously. And so I think getting to talk, let's talk a little bit about that. Cause I think that fear for a lot of people holds them back of, well, what if I put this money in and then in a couple of days, it's all gone. <laughs> so I, a point well taken. And uh, first of all, I, yeah, I would like you, my parents didn't teach me about investing. They didn't know anything about investing. They did instill a um, appreciation for saving uh, and being willing to save and, and defer gratification and that kind of thing. And that's extraordinarily powerful. So let's just start there. If any of your listeners already have that saving discipline, they are several steps ahead. And it is difficult to take the step into investing in stocks because they are volatile. I just got an email from uh, from a guy who attended one of our Chautauquas, which are these annual events where we go off and uh, get together with small groups of people. When, and he was one of those classic individuals that you're talking about, Jamila, who had been successful, had a good savings discipline, had accumulated a whole bunch of money in the savings accounts, and and he was really feeling kind of bad about that that he had that he had not deployed it in the stock market, particularly because the market's done so well in the past few years. And I said, Kyle, that's the wrong way to think about it. You've actually been very wise in waiting until you understood what you wanted to do and what the parameters and the risks involved in making that decision to move into stocks were. Better to do that, better to sit on your savings and maybe miss a little bit of market gains until you're absolutely comfortable that you know what's entailed in investing in stocks. That's one of the reasons that I wrote the book and and the stock series that you were nice enough to refer to. But nobody, nobody should listen to this and run out and buy index funds without being confident that they understand what it is that that means. And the fact that 
the market is very volatile. It will reward you handsomely over the course of decades. But in the short term, I tell people, if you don't stay the course, if you panic and sell when the market drops, and the market will drop, I'm not predicting it's going to do that tomorrow. I have no idea when it's going to happen next, but it will happen because that's the nature of the market. If you're not positive that you're going to stay the course, that you've tied yourself to the mass, so to speak, following my advice is going to leave you bleeding at the side of the road because you'll panic when that happens and you'll sell at the bottom because you didn't understand why it was happening. And more importantly, you didn't understand that it is a temporary thing. I was talking to uh, Christy Shen, who is a friend of mine, and she writes the blog, Millennial Revolution. Yeah, they've been on a podcast a couple of times. Ah, well, there you go. Yeah. So, you, so you know Christy, and, yes. and Christy is a, is one of the speakers at our Shtaklas. And, you know, there's research in human nature that's that's come out that basically says humans are more risk-adverse than they are driven by the potential for, for gain. So loss hurts more than gain feels good. And I said to Christy, you know, I just must be wired differently than most human beings because the prospect of the stock market dropping doesn't bother me at all. The prospect of me not being in it when it's rising and participating, that's what bothers me. So I just must be hardwired differently. And Christy said, no, no, you're not a special snowflake. <laughs> you know, you're, you're wired the same as the rest of us. The only difference, JL, is that you understand that those drops are meaningless. You understand that they're temporary at a deeper level than most people. It's not that you're more risk tolerant. It's just that you understand that there is no risk in the long term. And I love that. I would like to stick with that last part of what you said. There is no risk in the long term. What there is, let me just yeah. jump in at that point, and because what there is is volatility. Of course, yeah. If you look at a, uh, and any of your listeners can do this, if, if you go online and you take VTSAX, which is the total stock market index fund that Vanguard offers, that's the one I recommend the most, and you take VBTLX, which is the total bond market fund from Vanguard that I recommend if you need bonds, and you map them on a, a graph, um, you know, and they're online tools that will allow you to do this, and you go back 10, 20 years, you'll notice something really interesting. The first thing you'll notice is that the bond fund has a very smooth and very gradual line going up over the decades. And it gets you to a higher place than where you started, but still a pretty low place. But it's a very smooth ride. If you look at the stock fund line, the BTSAX line, you'll notice it is has wild swings up and down. But at the end of 10, 20 years, it is at a much higher point. And therein lies the difference. You have to be willing to tolerate those wide swings, and they could be terrifying, make no mistake. But if you do, if you are, instead of that where the bonds would take you without requiring you to endure those wild swings, you will, be, you will have a much higher result at the end of the decades. Yeah. And it's so, and something clicked for me as you were talking, and this relates to just life <laughs> and just the journey of um, reaching our goals, okay, including the financial goals we have. It's a long journey and there will be lots of ups and downs. And a lot of people, when the downs hit or when things are not working out, it seems like things deter them or they stop or they give up. And it's the people who continue despite the volatility in their lives or when things right ahead of them don't seem that great, when they're looking at the long term and what they're really working for, those are the people when they you know, get to their end point or when they're looking back at like what happened for them, they're like, wow, I've gained so much. I've gotten so much further. And so I just think it's good for people when they're thinking about how, you know, maybe in their day-to-day -day, things seem a little um, more hectic or not as positive. It's like it's the long term um, that you're working towards. And it is improving um, over time. You just sometimes can't see it if you're in the thick of it. Yeah, you know, I, I've often said if you were at the beginning of the journey or even in the early stages or even mid-stages of, of your journey, one of the best things that can happen to you is a major market decline. 
Because if you're in the beginning to mid-stage or even later part of your journey, you're continually adding money. And if the market declines, any given amount of money that you're investing buys more shares. And so you are ahead of the game. So the best possible thing that could listen, that could happen to your listeners, to your younger listeners, to your listeners who are early in the journey, is for a major market decline where they can pick up shares at bargain prices. And then for us older people, that's when you bring in bonds and that's the bonds are what smooth the ride for us, for us older folks and, and allow us to have dry powder to take advantage of market drops when they happen. But for young people, uh, you know, my daughter is 100% in VTSAX. And when the market goes up, as it has gone up pretty relentlessly over the last several years, um, I think, wow, that's good for me. It would be better for Jessica if it were plummeting because she's adding money every month. Right. How's that for how's that for counterintuitive? <laughs> yeah, no, and then I mean you could think of it if, if someone, you know, if you're thinking about this, it's like think of when you're buying something on sale. Like it's like just think about everything goes on sale, but it's still the value is there except for everything's on sale. And how like you'd be running to like let's just say to these stores that you love when something that was once two hundred dollars is now you can buy for fifty dollars. Knowing that again, like it's not gonna be on sale forever. I think the concept of like you know, you think it's going to be on sale forever. So now the whole value and perception of the value is like, who cares? I don't want it anymore because now anyone can have it. But knowing that, wow, this is like a flash sale. It's going to be on sale, not forever, but it's going to be on sale for maybe like a week, a day, whatever that is, right? And knowing that, like you would run to that store because you know that eventually they're going to mark this item right back up to where it was, or it might be more money <laughs> afterwards. Yeah, and if you happen to have bought that item before the sale, I mean, there's no point in kicking yourself. But if you need more of that same item, and you certainly always need more in terms of investment shares, and now you can suddenly buy them for less, I mean, this is not a time to panic and cry. This is a time to to be greedy and celebrate. Yeah. And I love how you qualify. Like, you know, you have to make sure you understand where you currently are. Like, you know, so if you are towards the end of your journey or an end of your working career and you need the investments right away or soon, then you're going to want to adjust your portfolio mix to be more conservative versus someone who is in it for the long term. You don't need this money right away. You can be a bit more aggressive. Right. So there are two things that smooth the ride, as I, as I put it. When you are working, it's not necessarily even tied to your, to your age, but more whether you're living on your portfolio or you're, or you're working and have earned income. And that tends to be when you're younger. So when you're working and have earned income, like my daughter, Jessica, at this point, uh, you have cash flow, assuming you're, you have the proper savings rate, you have an aggressive savings rate, you have cash flow from your earned income that you're putting in to your investments uh, every month or every couple of weeks or whatever the, the time frame is. And that's the money that takes advantage of those drops. And that's the money that smooths the ride. Once you have enough that you don't have to have a job and you don't have to have earned income and you're living on your portfolio, most people want to have something else to smooth the ride. And that's something else are those very stable bonds that don't have a great return over time, but they don't have the volatility of stocks. So different tools for different points in your life to, to smooth the ride and to take advantage of those inevitable drops in the market. Right, right. Okay, so I hope that this is encouraging um, anyone who's not fully aware or comfortable with index funds to do their own research, right? And um, take back some um, initiative to do like the what they need to do to get comfortable with it. And I love that you say, we're not giving you investment advice here to like go out and like just do what we're saying. But this is a good starting point for then now you to take this information and do more research until you get comfortable. But these things are out here um, and we don't know that they're necessarily out here because of who's in charge of what we see in media and um, who's selling us things. So I think it's that's where we come in to, to be curious and to take the like there's no risk in researching and looking things up. You know, the other thing that I, I would put out there, and again, I'll use my daughter as an example. I, I mentioned that I sort of turned her off to all of this stuff. And when she was in college, uh, she came home one time and I started up my lectures on investing in money. And 
And she stopped me and she said, Dad, Dad, I know this is important. I get it. I get it. I just don't want to have to think about it all the time. And that was an epiphany for me because suddenly I realized that, Jamila, you and I are the odd ones out. We're the weird ones. Most normal people don't obsess about investing. You know, they have better things to do with their, with their lives. But if they're like Jessica, if they're smart, they realize that it is important to get the investment side of your life right. Because as Christy, who we already talked about, Christy Shen, Millennial Revolution, says it's a great line. If you understand money, life is really easy. If you don't understand money, life is really hard. The good news is what Jessica, and by extension, everybody listening to us needs to know is really very, very simple. You can take all those other offerings that Wall Street wants you to buy because it lines their pockets and commissions and sweep them off the table onto the floor. And what's left are these really simple, inexpensive index funds. And so when you say do the research, I absolutely agree with that. But I don't want your listeners to be intimidated thinking, oh, my goodness, I'm going to just have to go so deep in the weeds with this stuff and I'm just not interested. You really don't have to go that deep in the weeds. You just need to understand a few basic things and then implement them. I tell Jessica the fact that she doesn't care about this stuff is, in a sense, a superpower. And what I mean by that is because she doesn't care and she does this one thing right, which is investing in VTSAX, the index fund, as much money as she can whenever she can and otherwise ignoring it, she won't be tempted to tinker with it. She won't be scared and panicked when it drops. She'll be off doing the things that are more important to her in her life. Whereas people like us who are watching this stuff all the time, we're the ones who who are always tempted to tinker and always are keenly aware of what the market's doing. And therefore, we're always the ones who are more tempted to panic when things drop. So any of your listeners should understand, yes, they've got to do some research They've got to understand a couple of basic things, but once you get those things right, your lack of interest actually works in your favor. Yeah, yeah. The lack of interest and also like the like I always say, like I'm a lazy investor. I don't want to like pick individual stocks. I just want to like set it and forget it, honestly. And I think it's like the easiest thing. It's so easy. Like once you come to find out about this and you like you get comfortable enough and you realize you're like this, you'll realize how easy it actually is. Um so one of the things that you do say um, in your uh, blog and in your writings is, and you know, I, I want to know if you still feel this way, but you say a house is a terrible investment. Is that <laughs> <correct>? <laughs> And it's funny because um, Christy and Bryce, when they were on my show early on, they've been on twice. So the first time they were on, they talked about a house being a terrible investing, investment and then um, how they skipped buying a house and it allowed them to retire early. And I have people who are on the podcasts who talk about real estate investing, right? And I think obviously you guys are talking about it from different angles because if someone's like pouring all their money into a home that is not being looked at as an investment, it it possibly is not the best thing for them. Who knows, right? But like leveraging and investing in real estate has brought a lot of people financial independence or freedom. So I'd love for you to discuss um, your views on real estate and home ownership. <laughs> well, that's a, that's a broad subject. So, yes. so let, let's start with your personal home, your personal residence, and then we'll talk about investment real estate. So the house you buy to live in, and and I wrote the most popular post on my blog is a post that I, that I wrote kind of, I I just dashed it off as, is kind of a funny little thing. And it was called why your house is in terrible investment. And I listed, I don't know, 10, 12 reasons as, as to why that was the case. I never anticipated the firestorm of attention that it would attract. It's generated the most hate uh, and also the most love, depending on which side of the of that particular debate the the people reading it are. But what confuses people is I'm not against owning houses. I most of my life I've I've owned houses most of my adult life, but I'm against the idea that it is a always a good or even commonly a good investment, which the real estate industry likes 
likes to push. It's not. It's a lifestyle choice. So when I owned houses, I owned houses that I could easily afford, and I owned them because they provided the kind of lifestyle that I wanted at that particular point in, in my journey. Um, so I, I, I don't rail at the idea of owning a house. I, I rail at the idea of being fooled that this is a, a good investment. If your goal is financial independence, you want your living accommodations to be as inexpensive as possible. And most of the time, in most markets, that means renting. Now, not all the time and not in all markets, and you got to kind of look at that individually and run the numbers. But houses are, by and large, expensive things to own. And there are lots of stories about people in Colorado and, and California who bought their house and a few, a few years later sell it for two or even three times what they paid for it. People forget the stories of the people who own houses in Detroit or in Cleveland where it didn't work out quite that well. So you owning a house is, is potentially a very risky thing to do, and it ties you to one location. Now, if you can easily afford a house and it provides the lifestyle that you want, then that's a spending choice you're making, not an investment choice you're making. Now, when it comes to investment real estate, that's an entirely different animal. And investment real estate, as you pointed out, has made lots of people very, very wealthy. It's also brought lots of people to ruin. And the difference is the people it's made wealthy are the ones who have taken the time to study it, understand it, and are careful and methodical in how they, they deploy their money and in their investments. It's a job. It can be a part-time job, but it is a job. And so when you're comparing results, if you compare it to something like an index fund, which takes little or none of your time, to investing in real estate, which takes a fair amount of your time, especially early on. There are people who manage to make it fairly, friends of mine actually, who manage to make it fairly turnkey and easy, but it takes time to get to that point. You would expect you're, you're going to get better. you better hope you would get better returns with your real estate investments because it's not only deploying your money, it's deploying your time. And if that's how you want to deploy your time as a side gig or even a full-time thing, then that's great. And real estate can be a very powerful wealth building tool. But you have to compare it against, hmm, I can go in something like BTSAX and not have to worry about it at all and have a whole nother career. or you know, if I have a career and I'm investing in BTSAX and I want to do something on the side, well, I could do real estate, but maybe if I did something else on the side, it would be even more lucrative. So that's the comparison you're making. And it's a very personal choice at that point that only the individual looking at it can decide. Yeah, yeah. I'm, I'm so happy you broke it down like that and made those distinctions because I think it is important that, and just think of it as, it can be a spending decision. And if that's like what you're consciously doing, you know, you're saying I want to buy this house and I'm willing to to spend this much and have this much debt as a part of my life because of it. If you can't, you know, buy it in, buy it in cash, then that's a conscious decision you can make. But like you said, don't get fooled or tricked into thinking every like thing is just going to be an investment, just like investment. That's not the case most times. Yeah. And the, the other thing that that kind of, concerns me is when I hear people saying, well, you know, I'm paying $2,000 a month in rent and I found a house and, you know, if I buy the house, my house payment is $2,000 and I own it. So obviously it's the better choice. Well, you know, your, your mortgage, your house payment is just the tip of the iceberg as to what that house is going to cost you. There are all kinds of expenses associated with a house that you don't have when you're renting an apartment. So you have to be very clear-eyed and take the time, especially if you're a first-time home buyer, to really understand how much additional expense there is for repairs and maintenance. Very few people buy a house and don't remodel it in some fashion. That's mm -hmm. one of the attractions of a house is you can make it yours. Well, nobody's going to spend a bunch of money to put a new kitchen into their apartment, but people spend tens of thousands of dollars to put a new kitchen into 
into their their houses. So there's there's a whole nother level of spending that goes along with houses. Everything from remodeling, if you choose to do it, to basic maintenance and repair, which you have to do. So you yeah, know, no, got to look at the whole range. You do, you do. Okay, so you right now, I'd love to know like what you're currently up to. You um, talked about Chautauqua, and I'd love for you to describe like what that is. One day, I hope to join you guys. But <laughs> um, what have do, you. yeah, what do you currently do with your time? So you're still like, are you working just on the blog and just uh, the finance, personal finance related things, or what, what's your life like nowadays? Well, to the extent that I work at all, <laughs> <laughs> I yes, I you know the. The blog has has become a, a sort of a small business, and and uh, fortunately, it doesn't take too much time or too much effort at this point. You know, when I'm in in the mood, I'll I'll tinker I'll tinker with the blog. But I'm a pretty old guy at this point, and I I kind of laugh when I see you know my friends like Christy and Bryce, and they're interviewed on our Market Watch because they have a great great story and they retired so young, and it's like you know no nobody's going to have me on market watch saying, wow, great story, man, man retires at 61. <laughs> I mean, that's, let's, there's no real, real story there. So yeah, I'm kind of at a traditional retirement age and we do uh, the Chautauquas, which uh, is something I, I created in 2012. We did the first one in 2013. And basically the idea behind Chautauqua is to go to a cool place to hang out with cool people and to discuss fun, cool things. All of which to find is what I think a cool place is and who I think are cool people and what I think is fun to discuss. And of course, the cool people come from the FI community and when they choose to uh, to join us. And we started out doing them in Ecuador. Let's see, in 2017, we did the first one in the UK. And then we did two in Greece last year. And we did three this year, one back in the UK, which uh, I love that particular venue. And then uh, we went to Portugal for two weeks. Each talk was a week long, by the way, and we limit the number of attendees to 29 and we have four speakers. So it's a very small, intimate group. And, uh, uh, and we, have a, we have a great time together in a cool place and uh, hanging out with cool people and, and discussing cool stuff. I've seen when people go and their responses or reviews of it. And it looks like it is a, like just a nice break and a time to like get together and discuss the things that like people we talk about, I talk about with people on the podcast or just in general, like in person in real life. And that's like my biggest thing is that we're creating like the online space is an amazing way to relate and connect with other people. Like otherwise without this, you know, internet, you wouldn't be like hearing my voice right now. Right. Like, so it feels like, there's so much of a wealth of information and, but we don't want to lose like that in-person connectivity and way people really know each other. Right. When you, which you can only know sometimes by looking at someone face to face. So I just love um, the concept and um, it sounds like a wonderful kind of time. Yeah, no, we, we do have a great time and without exception, people who've come have, have come up to me and said, uh, this has been one of the best weeks of my life. A, a fair number of them have come up and said this has been the single best week of their life, uh, which is obviously very gratifying for me to hear. And and the thing that, that makes it so powerful is that they get to hang out with each other. So what would you tell someone listening to this right now? What's like the one thing they can do? Because I have people, same kind of like, you, you know, as you talk about diversity of people who j- join you um, at your event, it's like the same people kind of diversity. I mean, are people who listen to this podcast, different right. varying levels of background and starting points and how much they earn. And, you know, some are well aware of index funds and already and already doing it. Some are not um, and are just like, wow, what is this? And it will be now, I'm sure, like trying to get into it. So if there was one thing someone should do after listening to this to take action on, what would that be? Or what would be your best advice for someone who wants to do something different after hearing this? Well, so I'm going to cheat. I'm not going to give you one thing. What I'm going to say is it kind of depends on the individual. So if somebody listening to this is in debt, job one is getting out of debt. And that means that you have to reduce your spending. So you have surplus capital. And that capital needs to be poured into blowing out that debt and getting rid of it. That's not easy, but 
the good news is if you do that, the discipline of saving, of spending less, and creating capital to put against that debt, and then every month sending that money against that debt and paying it down, it'll be very satisfying as the debt shrinks. And then when that debt is gone, in place you have the discipline of saving money. And all you need to do is take that money that you were using to pay down the debt and now shift it to building your assets to investing. So that's what I'd say to the people in debt. To the people who are just beginning the journey, I would say, understand, take the time to understand what index investing is, what investing in the stock market is all about, understand and appreciate the volatility of it, make sure you're willing to tolerate that, and then begin investing in in index funds and put as much money as you can in whenever you can and let it ride and enjoy the benefit. The third group of people, I would say, is there are people, and I get a fair number of them at Chautauqua when I do the one-on-one sessions with attendees, who have been investing for a while and who might actually have a pretty hefty net worth, but their investments are incredibly complex. They own far, far too many different things. And I would say for those people, again, you need to explore index investing, appreciate the simplicity of it. And to begin to consolidate uh, all of these diverse investments that you've picked up along the way into a much simpler and inherently more powerful plan. So Amazing. Okay, but I have to, I just have to, because I know (laughs) someone's sticking this in their head. When you've talked about the first group of people being in debt. Now, I have my own kind of what I tell people, but I I want you to say it. And it could be, it's fine if it's different. But if people are still in debt, one of the questions that I get from them is, should I still invest? What are your thoughts on that? So that's, that's somewhat of a complex question. So broadly and very generally speaking, my take would be to blow out the debt first and then worry about investing. It doesn't make any sense at all, for instance, carry credit card debt at 15, 18, 22% to invest in a volatile stock market that over time might give you eight to 10%. So absolutely you wanna blow out the debt first. Now, are there exceptions? Yeah, your home mortgage, assuming you've got a pretty good, pretty good rate, you don't have to pay off your home before you start investing. Do you have a student loan at an exceptionally low rate? By exceptionally low, I'm talking two and a half percent or less. Yeah, maybe you wanna hang on to that and invest instead. So those are where the nuances come in. Yeah, yeah. And I know it's like a complicated question. You can't just like answer in a minute. <laughs> but um, I appreciate you um, like kind of going a little deeper there because it is something a lot of people who like are listening are currently still in debt. And so it's one of the things that they face. But I agree with you to tackle your high interest rate debts like aggressively as possible. And like you said, you, you gave it in your advice. Like that means you're going to have to make some like changes, like you change the way you spend, make that sacrifice so that you can pay off the debt faster. That way you can start moving the swing the other way to start um, creating net worth and assets. JL, please tell everyone where they can find you. I'm going to link a lot of the um, articles that we mentioned that you wrote in the episode show notes, but just let people know directly where they can get in touch with you and find out more about what you're doing. My blog is uh, JL Collins, NH, which stands for New Hampshire, where we were living when I created it. Uh, jlcollinsnh.com. And everything kind of goes from there. I'm on Twitter and Facebook. And if you if you search JL Collins uh, NH, you'll find me on both those places if you care to. Awesome. Thank you so much, JL. This was amazing. This was uh, this was a blast. I had a I had a lot of fun, uh, Jamila. Thank you so much for inviting me. I'm honored to be here. All right. I hope you enjoyed that episode with J.L. Collins, The Simple Path to Wealth and Everything You Need to Know About Index Investing. If you know someone in your life that also wants to understand or is getting into investing or like to do things the complicated way, you know, we maybe (laughs) all have a family member or friend that like the latest craze or latest new thing that happens like crypto, all these NFTs, which nothing nothing's wrong with those investments, but they're not even investing in the baseline, meaning they're not investing in their retirement accounts, or they're not doing the simple things to build wealth. They want to kind of like leap 
leapfrog into the more complicated things. If you know someone like that, this may be a good episode to send them. And even for you, you know, so I really hope that this helped expose you and or help maybe just reassure you that it's okay that if you want things to be simple and easy when it comes to building wealth, I know I like it that way, that index investing and doing your research into things like this is a way to go. So I hope you enjoyed the episode. If you did learn something or or were inspired by it, please tag me at Journey to Launch. Take that screenshot on your phone and let me know what you think. I love reading your messages, reposting them and connecting with you. Don't forget, you can get the episode show notes for this episode by going to journeytolaunch.com or click the description of wherever you're listening to this. And you can still grab your jumpstart guide for free to help you on your journey to financial freedom by going to journeytolaunch.com slash jumpstart. If you want to support me and the podcast and love the free content and information that you get here, here are four ways that you can support me and the show. One, make sure you're subscribed to the podcast wherever you listen, whether that's Apple Podcasts, that purple app on your phone, your Android device, YouTube, Spotify, wherever it is that you happen to listen, just subscribe so you are not missing an episode. And if you're happening to listen to this in Apple Podcasts, rate, review, and subscribe there. I appreciate and read every single review. Number two, follow me on my social media accounts. I'm at Journey to Launch on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter. And I love, love, love interacting with journeyers there. Three, support and check out the sponsors of this show if you hear something that interests you. Sponsors are the main ways we keep the podcast lights on here. So show them some love for supporting your girl. Four, and last but not least, share this episode, this podcast with a friend or family member or coworker so that we can spread the message of Journey to Launch. All right, that's it. Until next week, keep on journeying, journeyers. Journeyers.